Our first storyteller tonight has 30 years of experience in Cincinnati as a social worker and mental health therapist. To balance the stresses of life, she sings, and if that fails her, she and her wife Rhonda have their daughters and grandkids that, you, that they can count on to keep them busy and smiling. Please welcome June Giuliano Hillskamp. I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, Ohio, the youngest of 13 kids. I know, right? When people first hear that I'm from such a big family, they often ask me the same three questions, same three or four questions. So I'm just going to answer those for you now, just in case you're wondering. Yes. No. Yes. And one. Yes, all 13 of us have the same two parents. No, there were no multiple births or twins. Yes, I grew up Catholic. <laughs> and one, we had one bathroom. If that's all you have, you figure out how to make it work. Now, my mom was the oldest of nine. She had a brother who is blind, and my Uncle Gil. And Gil stayed on the farm and lived with my grandparents uh, for their whole lives. He there had a chicken and egg business. And I mean a lot of chickens. He had three big chicken houses. They were two stories where the chickens roamed free on sawdust floors. There were 13,000 chickens in those three buildings. Now, his business was successful. Uh, so successful that he did what was popular to do in the 70s, and that was to build another building. Now, he sometimes needed a little extra help, so it wasn't unusual for my family. We visited often, and we helped as, as he needed us to do. Well, this new building that he was going to build was different than the other buildings. This one, the chickens, instead of roaming freely, they were going to be in cages, and these cages were going to be suspended from the roof of the building, and they were fed with this augered feeding system that ran the length of the building, and this fancy piped water that the chickens could peck at it, and it would drip down some water for them. And the lights were manipulated in this building to, to maximize the egg production of the chickens in there. So it was quite different. Now, Gil sold uh, the, the eggs and uh, took care of the chickens. He sold the eggs to a commercial buyer. He also sold to the public, people that would just come by and, and want to buy some eggs. Now, I have to admit that we country kids, we got a kick out of the fact that people from the city would drive like an hour from Dayton to come and buy these farm fresh eggs from my Uncle Gilbert. I mean, we just wondered, like, couldn't they just get a chicken? Well, Gilbert's cage house had four rows of cages, and between those cages was a, between those rows was a, a cement walkway, and under each row of cages was a big long pit or a trough where all the waste would fall. And if everything went well and the weather cooperated, we would push all of that waste down to the back of the of the cage house. Now, how that is done is, is like with this little tractor. Imagine a, a, a small lawnmower with a sidecar, but the sidecar is a big old blade, and that blade goes down into the pit, and then, and I love this because I could help and I get to drive the little tractor, and we would push the, all of that waste down to the back of the cage house where then we would load it onto a manure spreader and spread it out into the fields. Fun fact. We don't use the word manure on the farm. <laughs> Except when we're referring to that piece of machinery, the manure spreader, or maybe the act of using that particular piece of machinery, like dad's out hauling or spreading manure in the field. 
Other than that, it's all shit. Cow shit, steer shit, horse shit, pig shit, bull shit, and chicken shit. Okay, back to the farm. My adjacent to my grandparents' farm was a creek. It was called the Mile Creek. And the spring before I turned eight, there was some serious flooding. The creek overflowed and most of my grandparents' farm was, the fields were completely underwater. Now the buildings were kind of safer because they were built up a little bit on a hill, but, the, but the, all the fields were underwater and it was so deep that they couldn't get out. They were surrounded by water. So we had to bring them things. So the, the, we, the farm I grew up on was probably about five miles away. We had to drive around the long way to get to the back side of the farm, and they, uh, we had to park maybe a quarter or a half a mile away. We would take the stuff out of our car and load it into a bass boat, and then we would row to the house so that we could give them their food and their supplies. And this lasted until the, you know, a few days until the uh, flood waters dried up. Now, I said most of the buildings were safe, and that's true, except for the floor of that cage house, it flooded. So all of that waste in the pits, they ran out the back of the cage house and into the surrounding area. Now, I mean, it ended up in the fields, which is where it would have ended up anyway, but this was a sloppier way of doing that. So we have uh, the, 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 once the water's um, dried up, we had business as usual. A couple of months later, we had a job to do, and that was to exchange chickens. Let me explain. I'm sorry you're getting a lot of farm information. When the chickens get too old, they get beyond their peak egg-laying uh, years, we have to take the chickens out of the cages and we put them into crates and we take the crates and we put them onto a semi and the semi, we, we sell those chickens then to a poultry producer like, you know, like Tyson or something like that for meat and then Gil gets a whole new batch of younger chickens and we start the whole process all over again. Now, I, this is a huge family event. We got 16,000 chickens in that one cage house that we have to load, take out of the cages one by one and load onto the truck in that process. So anybody that is available to come has to come. Aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody is there. And I wanted to be able to help. And I was eight. So I was way too short to be able to reach up over the cages and get the chickens out but I was fast. And on this particular day, I would make sure that I wore my best play shoes because they helped me run even faster. Because my job was to catch the chickens that got loose. And the chickens would run everywhere. I mean, everywhere. They, did you know chickens can get up into trees? They can. Luckily for me, they can get up into trees much easier than they can get back down. So I would take advantage of that fact and I would climb the biggest trees. They would, they would get way up there and they always were way out on the end of the limb. But I was gonna prove my eight-year-old value to the activity of the family of the day. So I would go way out there and I would grab that chicken and I was so proud. There was this one chicken, this one particular chicken. It seemed more smug than the rest of them. I, I know I saw it look back over its shoulder at me <laughs> as it ran out the back of that cage house and I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna get that one. So it ran out and I ran out after it. It went out into this fallow flat field out there. It was, the field had weeds and grasses growing in and it went in and I was gonna go after that chicken and I was gonna get it. So. I went running and then I felt it. The ground under my feet started cracking and breaking like a frozen lake and down I went. And by the time I stopped moving and I had the awareness of my whereabouts, I was in T position, my arms resting on the crust of a whole pool of chicken shit soup. 
It was less left there apparently by the flood, but none of us knew that. Now, that chicken, I'm sure I saw it smile at me <laughs> as it went scampering on. Well, I tried to climb my way out of the hole, but the more I moved, the more the crust kept breaking around me. So, and I couldn't feel the bottom. My feet, I was just suspended there, and I knew I needed to stay still. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to need some help here. Somebody! Uh, nothing. Well, I knew that the cage house was way too noisy for them to hear me, and nobody saw me run out the back of the cage house, and, well, of course, my Uncle Gil never saw me. <laughs> Somebody! Somebody help! I fell in! Nothing. Well, I thought maybe they'd hear me in the house, because they were in the house making food for all of the people that were working, and... But then I realized that I'm like the very furthest point away in this farmyard away from the house, so it was probably unlikely that they would hear me, but what am I going to do? Somebody! Well, I mean, they're going to miss me, right? I mean, there's this cute little kid, and she's chasing chickens around, and they'll figure out that I'm, they'll notice my absence, and they'll come find me, right? Time passes. I mean, like 20 or 30 minutes. I'm hanging here. My arms are getting tired. They're too tired now. <laughs> Somebody! Nothing. Now, I start to get kind of disappointed at how long it's taking them to notice that I was missing and come and look for me at least. Nothing. Yo, somebody better get out here! <laughs> Nothing more time passes. You know that Home Alone movie? I can really relate to that kid who was left behind. So now I'm kind of starting to get mad. My eight-year-old mind starts running. I am the baby of the family, that's what they call me. They always ignore me at home. Why would this be any different? I'm gonna be out here forever. More time passes. Somebody, anybody, somebody. More time passes. Finally, one of my cousins was cutting across the yard to go to the hose at the well by the barn to get a drink. And he heard me. Hey, I need help. What happened? I fell in and I can't get out. Oh, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. So he starts coming toward me, but of course he just sinks right through the crust and he can't get to me. Everyone is bigger than me. Now, you see, the, the, the area that I'm talking about, this pool is like most of the size of this room. And I had made it out to the middle before I went down. So he couldn't get to me. He said, I need to go get help. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so he comes back with some people. I hear them talking about how, <laughs> look at this. This used to be the place that where there was a hill here. And, there, <laughs> and the construction left that big pile of dirt there. And this was the area in between. And look, it's flat now, huh? Look at that. A crowd formed. <laughs> they discussed how they might get me out. They formulated a plan. They debated on what kind of knots to put at the end of the rope that they were going to throw to me. <laughs> and then they finally, finally, came to the conclusion that they could rescue me. It took them several times of throwing the ropes to get them to me where I could reach them, and they were acting all stressed, tense. So they had very specific instructions about how I was to handle the ropes. 
So the one rope, and I was to put my hand through the loop and hold on. They'd pull it tight. It would get it go around my arm. No, 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 don't move the other arm. Just, just the one arm, get, put it through the loop and hold on. Okay, 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 okay. And then the, they threw another rope, exactly the same, same, very specific. And hold on to the first rope while you move your left other arm and put it through the loop. We will pull it tight. Okay. Okay, so, and they pulled me out. Now, the pulling out process, part of it, I was like an icebreaker through the crust. And, and part of it, I was like tumbling across the top of the crust. But they got me out. I was out, and, and, and I stood up. And, and now, I had no idea about any of the, that I was in any danger at all. But I could see the look of relief on all of these people that were standing there, my mom and my dad. And my mom came toward me, and then she got close, and she took, and she and everyone else took two steps back. Oh, oh my God. Now, my olfactory sense had long shut down. So it wasn't bothering me anymore, but let's, let's just think about this for a minute. Liquid chicken shit, crusted over, fermenting for four or five months under the Ohio summer sun. It probably was pretty bad. Now, I was still upset that it took them so long to find me, to even notice that I was missing. And now no one would come near me. And then I looked down and I noticed that one of my shoes was left back in the m hole in the muck. And my dad said there was no way we could go back and get it. And I was never going to see it again. I know. Well, they assessed that I was okay, other than scratches and now rope burns on my arms. <laughs> and so they all went back to work. My mom and my aunt took me over to that hose at the well by the barn, and they hosed me down with the coldest well water ever. And then they took me to the house, and they made me strip off my clothes and one shoe and put it and put it in a paper bag and go down into the basement to take a shower. Now, while I was in the shower, I'm sure the smell got worse. Now, I don't know if that's my imagination or if it was because I washed the chicken shit out of my nose and now I could smell. <laughs> or maybe it was because the warm water activated the ammonia and the oils that were in the shit on me. I mean, I kind of, if you think about it, what's that called when you do to me? A marinate? I was kind of marinating. <laughs> I was probably like hanging there for like two hours. <laughs> so, so it maybe got on me deeper than just, anyway. So I took a shower and I came up and my mom was like, oh, oh my God. I, I said, mom, I don't think that worked. And she said, she said, no, it didn't. And then she had an idea that the that she had heard that they use for when you get sprayed by a skunk. So she put me in the bathtub and this was like September, right? Really nice timing. My grandma had just canned tomato juice. So they went to the cellar and they got quart after quart after quart of tomato juice and they poured it on me. It was the temperature of a cellar that was cold. And they washed me down and scrubbed me down. Now, now really, my mom tried to help me do this, but she kind of kept gagging a little and needing... She needed to leave to get some air. So I washed my stuff down. I scrubbed myself good with this tomato juice. And it apparently didn't work. Because the next thing that I know, after they rinsed me off, my grandma walks in with a big, big ass bottle of lemon juice from the fridge. <laughs> and a lemon grumbling something about, well, I was going to make lemon bars later, but I guess not now. (Laughter) 
and my mom and my grandma took that lemon juice and that lemon and they scrubbed, I mean scrubbed, like they thought they needed to take that outer layer of skin off in order for the smell to get gone, which apparently also did not work. <laughs> so they, they've now done everything they can think of, so they just give up. Now, I have nothing to wear. I'm, I'm eight years old. It's not like we bring a spare set of clothes wherever we go anymore, like when I was really little. So, and everyone there is bigger than me, remember? Except for one person, my small but mighty German grandma, who never wore a pair of pants a day in her life. This is absolutely the most upsetting part of the entire day for me. <laughs> she went and to go get one of her work dresses. One of her oldest work dresses because she was afraid that the smell was going to ruin her clothes. So I had to put on one of my grandma's work dresses and wear it for the rest of the day because we weren't going anywhere. We weren't leaving. There was work to be done and is always the case on the farm. We weren't going anywhere until the work was done. So for the rest of the day, I wore my grandma's dress. I, oh, they shunned me to the outdoors. They couldn't stand me inside. So they shunned me to the outdoors. They made me take that bag of clothes and one shoe and put it on the burn pile to be burned with the trash. I spent the rest of the day alone, shoeless, burning from the lemon juice, sitting on the back steps of the house in my grandma's dress with my cousins and my brothers laughing at me. Thus are the circumstances of the shittiest day of my life. <laughs> Thank you.